So my uh, primary interest is young adult hip surgery, but within that I see a lot of patients coming in with uh, dysplastic hips. Um, so, um, so within that we see patients uh, primarily with acetabular dysplasias, but also femoral dysplasias, and uh, one is often coming with the other. Um, the majority of uh, spaces we see currently are due to infection, trauma, or iatrogenic, they're acquired dysplasias, but we do still see some congenital hip dysplasia in the UK. There's it's much less now because uh, patients or well, babies are screened at, at birth, at delivery, uh, to look for clicky hips. And if they have any risk factors like diabetes or breach or any other risk factors for uh, dysplasia, then they are ultrasound scanned uh, within the first week of, um, of birth and then treated quite aggressively by our, our surgical services. So um, I, I would say that uh, within hip dysplasia, we see um, grades between one and four. I, I think grades between one and three are, are fairly innocuous and, and, and mild hip dysplasias. It's the grade four uh, hip dysplasias that cause the, the most interest among surgeons because they're the most complicated ones to try and, to try and manage surgically. So, this is a, a unilateral crow four hip, um, uh, and, and we see. I think I've seen this three times now as a as a as an operating consultant in the UK, and this is because they're not coming through uh, from our local populations. These are patients that have come in from overseas with their uh, hip dysplasia, um, and because of that, they don't have the same um, level of understanding of the the problem. So. They come with their with a short leg and often with back pain as a result of the secondary uh, spinal scoliosis. Um, and that, that makes for a very difficult consultation because the, the, there isn't an operation that we have that can restore their leg length and their um, coronal spinal balance. Um, so you really need to be very specific when you're meeting them as to what their clinical problem is. If you've got a, a crow four hip, the ball isn't in the socket, it's a pseudoarthrosis. It's much like a Girdleston hip, and therefore it's not painful. And in fact, the, the pain they present with is primarily from their back due to the short leg. Um, patients who uh, have had a, a, a short leg for many years have been compensating for a long time. They may have a shoe raise um, and they have managed to get on often they're looking for cosmetic uh, reconstruction rather than uh, to, to, to make their, hap, their hip more comfortable. So if you imagine you've got a 12, 13, 14, 15 centimeter leg length discrepancy and you plan to do an operation where you can maximally increase their leg length by four centimeters, they're still gonna be left significantly short afterwards. And the end result is that um, these patients can be very unhappy with their surgical outcomes. So my general advice with, with crow four hips is to try and avoid operating. If they have bilateral crow four hips, this is a more interesting situation because uh, again, it's very rare, but, but the patients we do meet with crow four uh, bilaterally often aren't even aware they have it. So I've seen two patients in the last six years that have come in for knee replacements. And when I've been examining them, I've examined their hips as well for, um, for, uh, for completeness. And the hips, while they've been stiff in abduction, the hips have been moving comfortably. And when I've arranged it for an x-ray to assess why they're so stiff, we found that both hips have been dislocated for their entire lives and no one's picked it up before. It's never been assessed or, or treated. And um, I had a patient five years ago who'd had four normal vaginal deliveries with bilateral hip dislocations. Um, so the, these patients are generally happier. And again, I don't, I don't think they need to be considered for a surgical procedure. So um, as I said to you earlier, most uh, um, congenital dysplasia uh, is picked up in uh, uh, following delivery. Um, but there is a small number of patients who develop dysplastic hips during their adolescence. And we assess this by measuring the uh, lateral center edge angle of the hip and the acetabular index to give us some measurement of the depth of the sockets. And patients who are deemed to have a, a borderline or dysplastic hip 
I then offered the potential for a periastabular osteotomy, which works very well in terms of improving the depth of the cup and increasing the hip coverage. And so again, we're seeing these patients presenting for surgery in their 50s and 60s now with um, uh, abnormal anatomy secondary to their, um, their hip, initial hip surgery. So another, another um, with the advent of hip arthroscopy and hip impingement uh, uh, science, we're much more familiar now with how hips can impinge and um, how best we can uh, change the hip shape to prevent impingement and uh, ongoing labral damage. So um, one of the things we're more aware of now is uh, acetabular retroversion. So if you look at the plain x-ray on the left, you can see that the um, ischial spines are more prominent and there's a, um, a, a crossover sign where the anterior and posterior walls of the acetabulum cross in the center of the femoral head. Uh, and, and this is interesting for me as a young adult hip surgeon because I, can, I, I recognize it early and I can offer them surgery to, to, to trim down that rim and, and repair the labrum. And if I'm not winning, there is again a potential for a periastabular osteotomy to correct the version of the acetabulum in the, uh, in the AP plane. Uh, but beyond that, if I meet a patient who's developed arthritis with retroversion, I'm much more able to pick that up early. And I'm not finding that during the surgery, I'm suddenly in a position where I've got very little anterior or posterior wall, and I'm struggling to get a, a, a well-fitted acetabular component. So with a, with a case like this gentleman, um, I have several uh, considerations when I'm planning the case. The first is, where is the acetabulum? How high is it on the pelvis? Am I going to keep it there or am I going to try and bring it back down into the true acetabulum? I need to think about uh, how much coverage there is. Um, do I need to medialize the cup? Do I need to medialize it through the medial wall of the pelvis to get me some more bone to cover the, the, the top of the acetabulum? I need to think about the version of the cup. Is if the acetabulum is, is very retroverted, again, I may need to read much more anteriorly to try and get myself into some more uh, healthy host bone. On the femoral side, again, um, I, I, I'm, uh, I have to think about the version of the hip. If the hip's very retroverted, then as the hip flexes up, the jacanta is going to impinge on the pelvis and cause dislocation. If the hip's very retroverted, then uh, again, the jacanta can impinge in abduction um, and external on a rotation causing the hip to dislocate. So I may want to consider a femoral osteotomy to derotate the proximal femur and put it into a more neutral position and prevent impingement. If I have a very abnormal metaphysis and I'm planning to use an uncemented implant, I may need to plan how I'm going to maximally fit and fill the metaphysis to get the best fixation and the longest lasting implant, particularly in a patient who's maybe 20, 30 or 40 years old. Um, I need to consider the leg length. Now there's a limit to how much I can lengthen the leg. Historically, we're all taught that you can only lengthen four centimeters, but um, I, I've looked at the, um, the science behind this and it's based on a paper uh, um, published pre 1900s. And, and, and you know, the surgery at that stage is, is, it was not particularly um, as aggressive as perhaps we're doing today. So, um, uh, uh, um, but everyone wants to avoid a sciatic nerve injury with this sort of surgery. So we are very mindful about what we're doing um, and particularly at the planning stage. This patient's got a, a fixed adduction. Um, and so um, uh, I need to be planning my releases. If I take the head away, is the hip gonna come out into full abduction? Or am I gonna have to release the adductors uh, at the end of the operation? percutaneously to allow the hip to come out into neutral. Um, I need to be thinking about the spinal alignment. If a patient's young, he's got the, or he or she has the potential to straighten up once I correct the hip, the leg length, and the, the pelvic obliquity. Um, if a patient's in their 70s and 80s, there's no point in trying to address that. You're not going to win, it's not gonna change. And you may tip them over into a worse position in terms of their sagittal alignment, which they won't thank you for. I need to, be, need to be thinking about any scarring around the hip from previous surgery or from infection or from injury. I need to be thinking about um, the quality of the abductor muscles. Are they good thick quality muscle that's going to be able to work once I've reconstructed the hip or is it full of um, fatty change? So abductor muscle 
that where the muscles all turn to fatty tissue, you can pick up on an MRI scan and that will give you some idea about the level of function after surgery. And lastly, I'm going to be thinking about whether I'm going to approach the hip from the front and uh, isolate and protect the femoral artery, or am I going to come to the hip from the back and primarily try and protect the sciatic nerve? Um, So uh, as I said to you earlier, um, as we were talking, um, I generally use a posterior approach. As I say, it's extensile over the pelvic brim and down right down as far as the knee. I can get to um, any pseudoacetabulum around the uh, ileum and I can um, gently lift and mobilize the AB ductors and the femur while minimizing the necessary trauma to the uh, muscles around the hip. So within the acetabulum, I've got a, 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 um, a ladder of reconstructive options, which we use for primary hip replacement, but also for revision work. So we can uh, reconstruct any uh, acetabular defect. Within primary hips for, for dysplasia, I, I rarely need to use augments, but they are there and they are available. My, my main decision making is around where I'm gonna put the cup. If I'm gonna seat it high, I'm changing the center of rotation and that changes the forces across the hip and can result in an earlier failure of the reconstruction. Historically, there's been a lot of work using autograft, using the femoral head to, to, to re reconstruct bone around the hip. I, ha I have no experience of this. Um, I was always trained to use the host bone because we can now get such good fixation with unsmented implants and screws that it's unnecessary to use autograft. And when I have seen it it's always been for revising someone else's previous autograph fixation um, and uh, each time I've I've seen it I've seen a mess of broken screws and a failed bony union so this is a paper I picked up from that was published very recently from the Mayo they've got a, a big series of uh, uh, autograph reconstructions um, but have only managed to achieve 60% uh, survivorship in 20 years, which I think is probably quite low for what we're, what we're seeing now in the young adult population. So uh, this, this case is a lady with uh, neglected avascular necrosis and she had some other medical problems, which meant that she, we had to delay her surgery for a period of time, during which she started to lose more and more bone around the pelvis. Um, so as you can see, she's very short on the left um, and my reconstructive goals are really to restore leg length bring the cut back down into the acetabulum. Um, this lady's a low demand patient, so I'm not gonna make any big uh, effort to bring the, the, the cup down. I just want to get her, her cup into some good, strong uh, host bone. This is how I plan it using a um, uh, author view software. And really, the first thing I do is look for where I can sit the, boast, the, sit the cup most confidently with good host bone. And then I start thinking about where I'm going to position the femur, the femoral component in the femur to restore leg length and offset most accurately. And so once we've uh, reduced the hip, this is actually a, 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 um, a 44 millimeter cup and a 22 millimeter head. So we've had to use very small implants, the sort of thing that Charlie would have used in his day to try and get a, a reconstruction. But the cup's now under healthy host bone. I've not had to use any um, uh, autograft and I haven't had to medialize the cup very far through the pelvis to, to restore the center of rotation. Uh, this this um, lady has a, a clear femoral dysplasia. We, we, again, we see this more commonly in the UK um, following previous surgery or from fracture infection. It, it's unusual to see congenital dysplasia or developmental dysplasia like this. Um, there's been a lot of interest in managing these cases with the hip resurfacings in the UK because, well, because it's easy. You just, you know, take the neck off, put the cup in, put the head on and off you go. But in, in, in patients in there who are, become, who are in their 50s and 60s, because of the bow of the femur, they begin to develop stress fractures on the, on the lateral bow. And this causes the uh, reconstruction to fail early, obviously. Um, I tend to use these uh, um, ESROM hips. Now this is an uncemented implant. Um, the surgical technique means that you triple ream the femur. You, you, you ream down into the uh, distal femur 
then you read the metaphysis so we get maximal fill of the metaphysis of the um of the femur and then we we use a side reamer to ream out the calcar and this means that at the end of all this we can sit a um uh an implant uh, against host cortical bone all the way and gives us a very solid reconstruction now this particular implant has um uh, is fluted and these splines they grip the distal femur so this this implant becomes rotationally stable on the distal femur so i can um position this modular metaphyseal sleeve wherever I want in the femur and not have to consider um, uh, distal stability, which means that, uh, uh, hang on, as we, um, which means that no matter which way the, uh, the femur is pointing, whether it's retroverted or antiverted, I can cut the neck, position the sleeve in the metaphysis, whether it's pointing backwards or forwards, and then separately position the stem itself into any position of antiversion I like to restore normal, uh, normal version and therefore normal hip biomechanics. This is a very powerful uh, reconstructive uh, tool. Um, the implant has a coronal split in it as well, so that as the distal stem impacts into the bone, the, um, the, this, the, the uh, two sides of the stem come together and it has this additional uh, hoop stress, which controls the rotational for which rotational stability. Um, this this sleeves come in multiple different options. The stem itself, the centerpiece, comes in multiple different offsets and, and lengths. So you can reconstruct even the most complex hips in patients with with uh, Down syndrome or um, dwarfism or any of these other more complex abnormalities. As you see here, I've position the metaphyseal sleeve facing laterally or medially, anteriorly or posteriorly to get the best uh, reconstruction. So for this case we were just looking at, you can see we've used the, we've, we've done an osteotomy, we've translated the bone to best restore neutral alignment, position the cup in the normal uh, center of rotation, and then um, control the rotation of the proximal uh, um, uh, fragment of the, of the femur using the metaphyseal sleeve. And uh, you can see on the other theme with that this, we've, we've obviously done this um, six months before and that's healed with, a, with now a straight uh, femur, which will protect him from uh, stress fractures down the in the future. So this is a, a more common Perthes type hip. And again, that the primary problems the patients will be complaining of is uh, a short leg um, and restricted range of movement. The, the, um, I use a CT to uh, assess the version of the hip and in fact this isn't desperately uh, retroverted but often they can be um, and then it's a, a, a simple uh, template with the software and then we can reconstruct and reproduce le leg length very um, very accurately. Um, this uh, lady had a, a, um, con a congenital dysplasia and has had three previous surgeries the last of which was to remove the metalwork, which has had a, a variable degree of success. But she, she's now presenting with a, a stiff hip, um, a, a very antiverted femoral neck, uh, a leg length discrepancy, and um, a, a, a complex acetabular reconstruction as well. Um, so on the CT, again, both hips are antiverted, but the, but the left one is significantly more so at 50 degrees. Um, and I can use this as Ron stem, first of all, to uh, ignore the, um, the antiverted femoral neck by using this, by positioning the sleeve anteriorly and then positioning the, um, the femoral stem within the sleeve in a more neutral uh, 10 degrees antiversion uh, to reconstruct the hip more anatomically. And, and of course, we can bring the leg length down and, um, and give her a, a much more um, normal gait. Um, so this this um, uh, this gentleman's uh, um, Chinese. So it actually happened in the UK since he was in his uh, teens, but and had been working, running his own fish and chip shop. Um, but aged fifty eight, he decided he'd had enough and wanted to retire, and he came to clinic for an opinion. His his legs scissor. So when he sits in the chair, he sits almost cross leg by default because this right leg comes over the, the front of the left the whole time. And when he walks, he finds it very difficult to hold a, 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 um, a, a straight gait, if you like. 
so again the acetabulum has um he had a um uh osteomyelitis osteo um septic arthritis as a as a as a baby i think he was three or four years old he, he his story is not very clear because obviously he hasn't got any relatives locally to tell him but he had two or three surgeries resulting in this um uh um position of the hip that he's in now um and there was no there was no metal work there but the acetabulum is obviously quite high the um the femoral version is is very anterior and the end result is that he's got a very narrow offset and the, and the, the trochanter is uh, clearly impinging on the pelvis already. Um, the, the fixed adduction is partly due to the shape of the femoral head because it's, it's um, and the impingement around the trochanter and partly secondary to the tight abductors. Um, so the, the, the CT scan gives us uh, a, a clear um, picture of the um, uh, femoral version. It also shows that trochanter is very near to the pelvis and will impinge unless we do something about it. So I'm already starting to think about um, a femoral osteotomy to correct the femoral version. Um, the acetabulum has got some, some bone above so that I can reconstruct into some healthy host bone here. And I'm, I'm, I'm very near to the native, the, um, native acetabulum down here. Um, the other, other, other issues with him are we can see that the uh, gluteal muscles on the left are, are very thick and normal and on the right they are very thin and uh, a very poor quality but um, and again we can see them here but they are present and they aren't uh, and on the MRI which I haven't got a, a picture of that they, they were um, functioning so um, there was some potential there for recovery of his uh, abductor function. Um, my next decision is whether going from the front or the back thinking again about the sciatic nerve but I, I'm much happier going in from the back. I like to see the sciatic nerve. And for a case like this, where I'm, like, I'm gonna be lengthening him a significant amount, I really want to be able to mobilize the sciatic nerve and feel it during the surgery to make sure it's not uh, coming into my surgical wound, it's not at risk. And at the end, that it's not un under any significant tension, which would cause obviously a, a, a palsy for him. So um, I managed to bring the, uh, so I did, I did do an osteotomy. So, well, first of all, we put the cup in and that was relatively straightforward. Um, getting down into the hip joint through the scar tissue and mobilizing the femur was quite complicated. Um, but then the, uh, um, the osteotomy allowed me to mobilize the femur very freely. And in fact, what I did was prepare the distal femur first. So I had a, a, a stable hip to reconstruct, then start to uh, prepare the proximal femur separately. And once I had both sides prepared, I could um, line them up together to decide how much distal femur to resect. Um, if I tried to lengthen the whole femur, the end result would have been uh, lengthening the sciatic nerve to, too far and I would have given him a palsy. So preoperatively, we discussed the fact that we weren't gonna be able to restore his full leg length, that he would need to continue using uh, a shoe race, but a, a smaller one that he'd be able to manage better but primarily wants to be able to, to, to stop his, um, the scissoring of his legs to improve his uh, pelvic obliquity and enable his uh, secondary scoliosis to begin to um, neutralize. Um, and I, I guess this, this went well, considering the complexity of the case. The, the one problem I, I found was that once I prepared the, um, the, the proximal distal femur, when it came to impacting this uh, stem down into the femur, the, the, the metaphysis didn't come down as far as I wanted. So I put a little bit of graft in here um, and postoperatively it went on to unite. I think this is um, two months later. Um, so he, he's, he's much happier and accepts the fact that we haven't restored his full leg length, but his overall mobility and biomechanics are, are much, uh, much better. Um, this is another um, uh, Perthes case uh, with a, with a uh, quite significant bow on the femur as well, which we had picked up on preoperatively, but, but hadn't planned for as well as perhaps we could have done. Um, so uh, again, a very antiverted femoral neck. Um, she's got a significant scoliosis. This lady was only 38. I, I, um, in someone this age, I'll try and do some uh, lateral flexion views just to get an idea about 
how mobile some of these segments are so we can start thinking about um, if we neutralize the pelvic obliquity, is her overall um, uh, coronal alignment going to uh, significantly improve, um, particularly in someone who's young like this. Um, so on table, we've got a very, a, a very straightforward reconstruction of the acetabulum. Um, we uh, successfully reamed out um, and reconstructed the proximal femur without an osteotomy. We've got a good distance here. It wasn't impinging. I was very happy with that. You, you can see this, the, um, the split in the stem where the two sides of the distal implant come apart and are pushed together in a tight cavity. Uh, during the operation, I heard a loud crack and I, um, I could see there was a, a crack up here at the cow car. So I assumed that I'd crack the cow car and put these two cables on and saw this x-ray and was very happy that the stem bypassed the distal end of the um, fracture. And then we had a stable reconstruction on the ward. She was straight leg raising and she was able to walk for me independently on the ward. So I was very happy that she had a, a stable reconstruction. But um, uh, five days after discharge, she represented with this and clearly this is propagated and deteriorated. Um, again, the stem still appears to have some stability. Um, I think in retrospect, if we look back at this uh, lateral view, you can see the cortex is very thick and strong here. And uh, anteriorly though, it's very thin. And it's, it's these uh, changes in um, the stiffness of the bone in abnormal bone that we, we're not as, as, as easy to, is, which aren't as easy to recognize basically. And so when you're preparing a stem as you would normally, you, you, this is something that you, you, is easy to miss and um, you don't pick up the warning signs quite so, quite so easily. So uh, anyway, I, I plated this with a, um, this is a Zimmer NCB plate, which uh, allows me to place screws front and back around the femoral stem and some cables to hold the, um, the bone while it heals. And it's healed very well. And her overall, um, recovery has been excellent. She's, um, you know, independently mobile and her spinal alignment significantly better with her obliquity and her, her leg length. Um, this gentleman was uh, 59 when he came to see me. He'd been to uh, several centres around London and, and the South East um, looking for an operation. He, he was coming in saying that his, his hip was painful, but clearly his hip is, uh, is, is at all intense, it's arthrodes. So the, the real symptoms he was struggling with was, was low back pain. And he'd been working as a, um, a train driver for 30 years successfully with this hip as it was following, an, uh, following a motorcycle traffic accident in his twenties. He'd, he'd been treated on traction and this had, this had, um, this had united in this position. Now, um, the, um, you know, he's clearly got some shortening. There's clearly a, a difficulty reconstructing the acetabulum primarily because the width of this acetabulum was 80 millimeters. So that's bigger than most of the revision cuts we have on the shelf. Um, the CT scan shows that there is uh, callus all around the um, hip. So planning whether to come into the hip from the front uh, and protecting the femoral artery or coming into the hip from the back and protecting the sciatic nerve was, um, was an interesting dilemma. Um, in, in, the, uh, um, in the event, I came in from the back, um, taking out this part of the posterior wall, but the hip still wouldn't um, rotate or translate because of the uh, bone at the front. I, I had to cut the neck in situ and then a, a, enable the hip to slowly translate anteriorly across there. Um, take out the femoral head uh, piecemeal with an osteotome and then use the osteotome to come through the anterior wall of the acetabulum so that this, this bone here wouldn't then impinge and take this out, out piecemeal um, nervously around the femoral artery. Um, the other interesting uh, um, aspect of this case is that the uh, femoral head is healed outside of the, um, or posterior to the, to the pelvis. So here is the, um, the back of the ileum and the, the, the center of rotation is well out of the pelvis. It, it really should be back here to restore the normal center of rotation and allow the hip to um, uh, function better and last longer. So um, I spent some time planning this and I used a cemented stem, which gives me a, a lot more freedom in terms of version and, um, uh, and leg length. Uh, so I could concentrate primarily on the acetabular reconstruction.
Um, I've actually used these augments for this case, which is uh, um, unusual for a primary hip. And I position one of these augments behind the cup to bring the acetabular component back into the back under the pelvis um, and, and, and back the center of rotation back into the, uh, um, the correct sagittal alignment. Um, and we've managed to, despite the side of the pelvis all being caved in, we've managed to restore him back to his normal offset. So the abductor muscles where they were quite uh, weak and wasted preoperatively, have got the best chance of uh, function and restoring normal gait. Um, so this, this last case is a chap who um, is a, a very sad story. He'd age, age 13, he developed a, a slip tip and um, had presented to his GP who wasn't very impressed and had written to the headmaster of his school and said that um, he'd been, he was a shirker and that if he complained of hip pain, they should ignore him. Anyway, the eventual outcome was that the hip turned out so far that when they came to try to fix the hip, um, it, it fits in a very poor position and then the, um, the femoral head uh, collapsed and failed. He then went to one of the paediatric uh, um, limb reconstruction units and they had two attempts at trying to re uh, reconstruct the hip culminating in this attempted arthrodesis which has also failed. They then tried to remove the metal work and again obviously that uh, th this metal work is encased in bone so they, they, they failed in that as well. By this point, he was um, struggling at school and um, he then had a very sad uh, adolescent life and ended up living on the streets and had a drug, a drug and alcohol problem. Um, but he, uh, with the help of his family, was turning his life around and came to see us in his, when he was 40 um, and wanted to try and fix his hip. Now, he, he's, his primary problem actually was this fixed a deduction again. And like the Chinese gentleman, his hips, his legs were scissoring, which meant that he really struggled to walk at all and had a very poor gait, a very, very a gross uh, pelvic obliquity and secondary scoliosis, but the potential to have, have some restorative uh, um, restoration. Um, so you, you can see his, his leg length obliquity is quite uh, um, severe. These, these 3D CT scans, they, they look very clever and impressive, but in fact, they don't really help me very much with the with the planning of the uh, planning of surgery, um, uh, but for the, in this case, I wanted to see how how much of the metal work was actually visible because the first stage would obviously be to try and take this out. And I warned him that we may take the metal work out as a first procedure, and then if we weren't if, if we had to, to damage the femur to do that, or I wasn't happy to continue, I may have to stop at that point. Um, but in, in fact, we managed to take it out in one go. I then wanted to try and take down the the um, uh, the hip, the, the, um, the bone around the hip to mobilize it and try and uh, bring him out to a more neutral abduction position and then um, work on the acetabulum uh, to try and uh, reconstruct and uh, reconstruct his leg length. Um, so the, this um, MRI scan is looking for fluid around the metal work, suggestive of infection and looking at the abductors to see what sort of condition they're in. It's actually clear on the CT that you've got good muscle bulk here and very poor muscle here, but you can see this is muscle rather than fat up here, which made me feel more confident for him. Um, uh, we can see that there is an acetabulum of sorts there and, and medializing the cup, we're going to be able to get it under some good host bone and get a good reconstruction at that level. And we can see that the femoral version is very neutral. Um, but that there is a uh, bone in the anterior and posterior walls that would allow me to seat a, a, a cup confidently. Um, so he, here's the reconstruction. Uh, again, I've used a uh, cemented stem, primarily so I could ignore any metal work that was um, sitting in the stem. This was all primarily in the, in the greater trochanter, so it didn't really get in my way at all. Um, but using cement again, I could ignore the proximal femur and concentrate on doing the more complicated acetabular reconstruction, uh, taking out the metal work, getting this into good host bone. The cement restrictor has slipped and that's resulted in a, a large amount of cement, but poor interdigitation in this gentleman, unfortunately. Um, but we have restored his uh, leg length. We have neutralized his pelvic obliquity and we have significantly improved his um, uh, spinal scoliosis. Okay.
So you, that's a series of cases we've, that, I, that I've presented from, um, uh, um, from Frimley. Um, as you can see, most of the cases we see now are acquired rather than congenital because our screening services are so, are so uh, acute now. Um, and most of the more complex cases we see in the UK are patients from overseas who have moved to the UK with their families and then present to us with a, um, a long standing and uh, often quite complicated um, clinical problem for us to solve. But part of the, my interest is solving these complicated problems and, and trying to get as good as good a, uh, uh, a reconstruction for the patient as possible. Uh, have you got any questions about the, the Thank case? Thank you so or... much, uh, Dr. Uh, Storage, for this uh, very uh, important presentation about a very difficult topic to treat. Uh, before, sir, we move to a moderation with uh, Dr. Amin and Dr. Hussam, I have two questions, sir, if you allow me, please. Of course. Uh, first question, in, in this plastic cases, do you, do you routinely do soft tissue release before uh, doing the hip arthroplasty? So, so generally speaking, in, in, in a lot of these um, acquired cases, the, the hip is literally stuck down. And to get into the hip joint, I have to take down a lot of scar tissue first. So uh, usually I, I, I go through the fascia and then uh, when I find the trochanter, I then basically stick to bone to come down around the femoral neck um, and onto the acetabular rim just to get my exposure. And often at that point, the hip still won't move at all. And I have to either plan a, a, a neck cut in situ or um, start removing bone from the acetabulum or from the femoral head just to get some space to be able to move the, the, the proximal femur out of the way to be able to reconstruct uh, anything. So yes, I, I usually have to take down scar tissue before I can even start the case, absolutely. Yeah, uh, the second question, sir, please. Uh, we usually do a stabular reconstruction using a uh, bone graft, either from the head, we use more sliced bone graft from the head or iliac bone graft from the iliac crest. Uh, but when do you say, I have to use an augment? So, you, so um, I think augments aren't available everywhere. So I'm very, uh, I'm very lucky that they are available for me to be able to use them in the, where I work at the UK. Most hospitals in the UK don't have uh, augments, but my, um, my background is, uh, part of my practice is revision hip surgery as well. So I'm very used to using augments to reconstruct complex uh, acetabular defects. Um, in a native hip, I use them very, very rarely. If I want to bring the cup down, um, uh, lower, um, so bring it from the ileum back down into the native acetabulum, then I may use an augment just to push it down and, and, and bring my center of rotation back down to where it should be. If I want to bring my center of rotation from behind the pelvis back under it, uh, I may use one behind the cup just to push the center of rotation back in under the pelvis again. I found that a very useful technique as well. Um, I, I, I think the um, the, the bony allograft is a, is a, a very well-recognized technique. It's been around for a very long time. Um, I just, uh, I have less experience of it. And the cases that I have seen have, haven't gone so well, but me that may be because the cases I don't see don't present to my practice. And so I don't need to, <laughs> I don't need to worry about them. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Dr. Rami, you are the moderator with uh, Dr. Sturridge and Dr. Hussam also. Mr. Serge, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and thank you very much for the brilliant talk as usual. So uh, I will start my question from the preoperative assessment. Uh, in case of bilateral hip dysplasia, what is the best workup plan for them? Do you usually request CT scan uh, or do you assess the spine and uh, templating? How would you template bilateral hip dysplasia? So if it's a um, gross dysplasia like a crow four hip, then I try very hard to avoid operating on this patient group because um, their leg lengths are equal, their spine is straight, there's no gross, uh, um, and, and their hips have pseudoarthroses, so they, they, they don't have significant pain. So you have to be very careful about why you're, what your indication to operate is. Um, if it's a lesser dysplasia like a Perthes hip, or a, um, uh, they've had a, um, like, like the femoral dysplasia I showed you earlier, then what I try and do is uh, one hip at a time. Um, so 
in the UK, we do operate on both hips at the same time for um, uh, uh, a fixed flexion deformity. But beyond that, we try and do one hip at a time because we, we want to minimize the risk to the patient, basically. Um, if they have bilateral perthase hips, then I would try and restore uh, the leg length the same. I wouldn't try and lengthen them at all so that when they are walking with their new hip on one side and the other hip still dysplastic, they're not aware of leg length discrepancy. And then when we come to the second side, I would try and keep the leg length uh, the same. So, so the outcome is good, is, is better for them. Um, uh, so we would not operate on bilateral uh, dysplasia at the same time. And um, it, it's quite unusual to see it now in the UK. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have received two questions about spinal pelvic dissociation, one from Mr. Kapil and one from Mr. Imad. Uh, the spinal imbalance, is it either balanced or unbalanced? And each one of them is either rigid or flexible. Which case would you say to the patient, go fix your spine first and come back to me? So the, the, the problem with hip surgery is that it's usually very successful. So the spinal surgeon will always say to you, do the hip first because you'll get a much better outcome than me. So it's difficult. Um, the other thing is that um, when I'm assessing uh, a patient's hip and spine, if they are very young, then they will still have some flexibility in their spine. I will do a, um, a, a um, scoliosis views with the spine flexed to the right and to the left to see how much mobility there is and at what level. And then you can start uh, um, uh, counseling the patient that what you expect to, to improve in terms of their spinal alignment with a hip replacement. Um, the two cases at the end there had very fixed deformities and, and just correcting their hip to neutral neutralizes the pelvis and will improve their spinal alignment. But in a, in a 70 or 80 year old patient, you're not gonna be able to achieve that. And if they are, if the hip you're replacing is on the longer side, then you have to be very careful that you don't lengthen them anymore. In a 70 or 80 year old, I wouldn't try and shorten the hip because if you try and do it without an osteotomy, you will make the hip unstable and they will dislocate. And, not, and an osteotomy is, complicating an operation in an elderly patient unnecessarily, I think. So I would just try and keep the hip as, as neutral as I can. If it was the shorter leg side, then you can lengthen the leg with the hip replacement. And that does improve their, uh, what they consider to be their leg length discrepancy. But if you lengthen it too far, you will push their um, spine into a worse deformity and they will feel uh, unstable and uh, their back will feel worse. And so that, that's, a, a, that's a big risk for you. Um, in terms of um, hip joint stability after hip replacement, there's a lot of talk about this in the UK at the moment in terms of um, uh, spinal fusions causing, uh, resulting in hips becoming uh, more unstable in certain positions. But um, I, I'm not experiencing that in my practice. I'm quite careful about uh, um, testing my hips uh, very aggressively, interoperatively, to make sure they are going to be stable. And I use 36 millimeter heads, particularly in patients who I have a concern about. So anyone with a spinal, uh, a spinal fusion or with Parkinson's or some other reason might be concerned about spinal stability, I'll use a bigger head. Um, and uh, yeah, but we're, we're not seeing uh, high numbers, of, well, we're not, we're not seeing dislocation on a regular basis in the UK anymore, really. Uh, would you? Uh, put the cup uh, in more retroversion or antiversion with such cases? No, I, I, I um, so I position my cup um, uh, primarily in, a, in about 30 degrees of um, antiversion and I close it down. I think closing it makes it a lot more stable. But, uh, you know, if I position the cup and then I, I trial the hip and it's not stable, then I will... Um, I will take the cup out and reposition again, I'll change it. Um, but, you know, my, my test for stability, I will, I will pick up the, the, the leg, pick up the femur, and I'll use my full body weight to push it up as high as I can beyond 90, 120 degrees, up, up as far into the chest as I can to make sure it's stable anteriorly. I'll look to make sure the hip uh, internally rotates to 45 degrees at 90 degrees flexion. I, I mean, my hip can't do that. So if the hip I'm operating on uh, is stable at that level of rotation, it, it is very stable. 
and then I will uh, fully extend the hip into uh, hyperextension and externally rotate to, to make sure it's not going to come out the front. And if I'm doing those using my body weight, that's, that's, and I haven't even closed the capsule or, or repaired the, um, uh, the fascia, then that's a very stable reconstruction. And I, I really don't get worried about um, spinal stability. I, I don't use hip precautions. I encourage my patients to ignore the stuff the physios, physiotherapists tell them on the ward and to get on and use their hips. Um, if you look online, there's lots of videos of patients going out to the gym two weeks after their hip replacements and, and doing silly things. And they seem to cope very well. There was a, a, a patient um, last summer who um, came into hospital uh, two weeks after his hip replacement. He'd been out mountain biking. He'd come off his bike, hit a tree and broken his leg below his hip replacement. The hip didn't dislocate. He broke his femur. And uh, this is two weeks after hip replacement surgery. That's amazing. Yeah, yes, it is. Uh, Intraoperative question uh, is the aim of the uh, uh, to put the hip in the true acetabulum, but when do you say that I would put the cup in high acetabular center? Yeah, yeah, so it, it, it's to do with the patient's physiology. If they're elderly, if they have um, uh, lots of other medical, medical, medical comorbidities as well, then I will uh, position the, the cup higher up because to try and do a more complicated reconstruction it makes the risks of surgery go up and um, the operation takes longer. So they have a higher, a longer anesthetic, they bleed more and they recover much slower. And they're not, they're much less likely to, um, for that reconstruction to fail. Okay. If they're a younger patient, so they're, they're 30, 40, 50, I will, I will make a lot more effort to bring the center of rotation back down to where it should be so that the, hips got, got is exposed to the normal sort of biomechanical forces and will have the maximal longevity really. Uh, uh, with crop four, it is very tricky to find the true establum. Yeah. Uh, would you go with the TAL land, as a landmark to find the true establum or there is another landmark for you? So all, all the tissues become very uh, difficult to um, right. identify in, in a crow four. But what I what I what I do is I look for the I look for I find the the femur I find the trochanter I follow the bone down to the pelvis and I then follow the um, pelvic bone down south till you get to the um, uh, su um, major acetabulum. But if you look for the teardrop and you put your retractor in there, then you know where the bottom of the pelvis is, where the where the bottom of the um, cotyloid fossa is, and that's your landmark. And then you want to try and get your acetabular component into that. Um, I mean, there's always good bone stock down there. It's, it's not been um, loaded ever, but there's usually more bone there than often there is up on the ileum where you're trying to find something which doesn't really exist. Um, so mm -hmm. yes, and I will use a very small cut. I'll position it down there. But then the difficult, you know, that, that bit's relatively straightforward. The problem then is getting the, the femur back down into the cut. And there, there are, um, you know, a, lot, a number of papers out there of, of surgeons who, who do just push the, will push the whole femur down, keep it intact, and then use a cemented hip, but sit the femoral, femoral component low in the femur to be able to reduce the hip and, and, and do manage to get a re reconstruction doing that. But I think you get a, a better biomechanical outcome if you oste osteotomize the femur, then you can control the rotation of, of the trochanter to prevent impingement, you can, um, uh, um, and you can um, best restore the hip biomechanics. Either technique, you're not going to regain full leg length. So, you, you know, either way, you're still going to have a patient with a short leg at the end of it. And if they, if they are telling you they want to have an operation because their hip hurts, but the reality is they want their leg to be the same length, they're going to be unhappy and the complication rate from a crow four hip reconstruction is high and there, the, the, there is a, a high risk you have an unhappy patient with an unhappy complication as well so I, I'm very careful around those cases. Uh, brilliant thank you very much. Uh, about the balance between medialising the, uh, the cop and avoid uh, SQ femoral impingement what yeah. is your trick to, to achieve this balance? So if you're um, uh, with a dysplastic pelvis, if you're, you often need to medialize the cup 
just to get the cup sitting under some good host bone. So sometimes I will ream through so I can see through the medial wall and I'll create a medial wall defect. Um, you can then use the femoral head, uh, you can take some of the bone and, and use it, push it through your defect to create a new acetabular bone stock within the pelvis and then put your cup in. And, and then you want to um, have uh, increased the hip offset to move the transfer away from the pelvis, but also because your abductor muscles are gonna be pretty, pretty poor, they're gonna be very weak. And the, the, the higher the offset, the less strength you need to actively abduct that hip. So if you increase the offset, you make the hip more stable, you make it, um, you need less strength to, to abduct the hip actively, and you'll get a, be a better gait and a happier patient afterwards. Um, lots of these implants, so the Edgerom hip I showed you uh, just now, there'll be a limit to how far you can uh, increase the offset. But the further you do, that, that my experience is the happier the patient is, basically. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there is a question about uh, a segmental or cavitary defect when you reconstruct crowd two or three. When you, uh, intraoperative, when you find a superior lateral uncoverage, more than 30%, would you use an augment or bone graft or change your uh, cup uh, implant? So, so Crow 2-3 um, is, is less of a, um, you know, the hip isn't as high, the reconstruction is less complicated, and usually you would be fine with a, um, just a, a standard acetabular shell. The, the case we saw at the beginning with the, um, with the very uh, steep acetabulum. Um, all I've done is use a very small cup and bring it down as low as I can into the acetabulum and medialize it as far as I can to get some coverage. Um, and that's, that works very successfully. So I guess when I'm, when I'm reconstructing a hip like this, I'm always thinking about the next operation. So if your first operation, you're already moving into augments and cages and screws and all this stuff then when this when this when this reconstruction fails you've got nowhere to go if you start with the simplest solution you'll have a faster operation you'll have a um uh, a quicker recovery and so a happier patient in terms of the level of function and you've got all these you know plan b c d e if you have a problem during the operation or if they come back 20 years later and the hip started to fail um, so uh, I guess my advice is keep the reconstruction as simple as you can. Um, and I would sooner re medially and medialize the cup under healthy host bone and save my more complex augments for uh, revision surgery if we ever get to that stage. Okay, perfect. There's a question about the, use, the usage of fluoroscopy during a uh, dysplastic head. Do you, have you ever needed to use the x-ray intraoperatively? So uh, um, one of my fellowships was in Australia with a surgeon out there who used x-ray a lot during the operation, but we spent a lot of time during every surgery uh, worrying about whether, this, whether the fluoroscope was still sterile or not. And I didn't think it offered very much. Um, uh, in the UK now, we are moving towards uh, day case hip arthroplasty and within that pathway there's no room for a post-op x-ray even so the, the future pathway will be we replace the hip the patient goes home and the x-ray is six weeks later which which makes me nervous now but I suspect in two or three years time I'll be more confident with that but with the the revision work and the dysplastic hip work we do now I will, if I'm worried that something's not going as planned, then I'll make a bigger incision and go and have a look and see what the problem is because the x-ray is not gonna um, help me fix the problem. It's just gonna show me there's a problem and I can see it by going and having a look for it. Okay, perfect, thank you very much. About the decision-making from cemented or uncemented uh, femoral stem, what is your advice for us to make this decision easy? So, so the uncemented stem is much more expensive. So, <laughs> so, the, so I use the uncemented stems for the young patients who I want to get the hip exactly right because they're the ones who are going to want the hip to last 40 years or more. For older patients and for patients with very complicated um, acetabular reconstructions, 
I want a, a, to cement a, stick, a hip in, I can change how high or low it sits, which way it points, the version, um, uh, the various and vagus alignments. I've got much more uh, flexibility there. Um, and of course, it's much cheaper. So for uh, older patients, we use a lot more cement because we're not looking for something to last 40 years, but maybe 10, 15 years tops. Uh, so that's a much easier decision, yes. Uh, that was the end of my questions. Hassan, do you have to <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Sarge. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sarge, for this marvelous talk. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sarge, please, I have uh, uh, two more questions, if you allow me, please. Okay. First question, uh, uh, do you prefer to use the dual mobility cup in these plastic cases? So, um, interesting, I, I went to a talk in France uh, two years ago, and a surgeon there uh, presented his series of um, hip replacements in teenage and 20-year-old patients all with dual mobility hips in them. And it made me very nervous because we don't really know the long-term uh, outcomes of these, um, uh, of these implants. Um, as I said earlier, I think the majority of our hips are very stable um, uh, and I rarely use dual mobility. I did one um, uh, 12 months ago for a patient with a, who was very, very low demand had a long stem, uh, long femoral stem revision going down to the knee, and one of these complex um, acetabular cups with the screw in, uh, so you screw it into the pelvis, and my, and it was very medialized, and her bone con bone quality was very poor, so uh, rather than take the implants out, I cemented in a dual mobility cup into the metal shell, and that seemed to 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 to, to stabilize her hip, so no more dislocations. Um, but beyond that, we don't see much instability in, uh, uh, anymore with, with modern implants. Um, there's a lot of talk about using dual mobility for patients with neurological conditions like Parkinson's or, um, or patients who've had a stroke or are maybe less reliable. Um, but um, I, I think historically I've been worried about um, the implant disassembling. There was some uh, work in the 90s that, that, that demonstrated that they could come apart and that was causing problems for, for um, surgeons. I think the modern bearing is much better and I'll probably start using them more now for patients who are um, having uh, maybe their second hip revision, but for a primary hip, it's, it's um, uh, in a dysplastic uh, patient, often the cup is very small. So, if you want to put a 44 millimeter cup into the pelvis, then there's no room for a, a um, durability cup. Um, and if you're going to use a, um, let's say you put a cup in and you want to use durability, then it may be no bigger than using a 36 millimeter head anyway. You may not get any more advantage than that. So I'm still quite cautious around durability, but it is becoming more popular in the UK. I, 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 I agree with that. Yeah. My second question, sir, from your uh, long experience, very long experience, have you been faced with a case of severe dysplasia that enforced you to use constraint cup? Uh, no, I haven't, no. So yeah. I, I've, um, I haven't seen that. So when I was a, a, a trainee in the, um, about 11, 12 years ago, the constraint liners were very popular. Um, my experience was that there was a lot of surgeons who were worried about hip stability. So they put in a constrained liner and didn't, think, didn't worry about the, the hip as a result of that. They assumed the constraint would, would sort any problems out. The reality was of course, that a constrained liner results in impingement and impingement in poor bone quality, particularly in elderly patients leads to um, the cup uh, failing and levering out quite early. So I, I do try and avoid those. Having said that, I, um, uh, I replaced a hip, uh, I think two weeks ago for um, so a 60 year old patient who has um, stage, four, um, uh, stage four lung cancer. And he has a, had a large metastasis in the acetabulum above his hip, hip uh, above the um, hip joint. Um, and I've used a cage reconstruction for that. And um, to get the cage and I've lifted the abductors off the ileum to make space to put the cage into the defect. Now that, that's worked very well as a reconstructive tool, but the end result is that the hip stability is, isn't as good because the abductors are damaged. So off the back of that, 
um, he's dislocated and he, and he came in uh, this morning for um, uh, with his hip out. So I spent this afternoon uh, putting it back in closed. But next week I'm planning to uh, take the acetabular liner out and put in a, a constrained liner to um, uh, to hold the hip for the the last 12 months of his life in effect, really. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sturridge, for uh, accepting our invitation and for sharing your experience with us tonight. Uh, it was a marvelous scientific night. Thank you so much, sir.